It's so good to be here. It's a little freaky, actually. It's been 25 years since we've, um, in fact, I don't think we've ever, I've, we've been in the, this building before, but uh, never have spoken here. It's really a privilege. Um, my mind has been going nuts with memories. I was going, um, I think I talked to Bob Madden yesterday, and I told Bob I could count, I, I, I rattle off every name of every elder in January of 1980 when I came to faith in Christ. It's just crazy how God just takes you back in there. I remember things that I was taught along the way from the two pastors for the short time we had them, or that I was under their, their uh, tutelage. And um, certainly remember all the hard things we learned since we were here without a pastor. And um, our mentor was Bud Hopkins, Wayne Hopkins. Some of you remember him as an interim pastor. Wayne told Jackie and I when we left in 1989 that uh, she and I learned more in five years than it takes most pastors 15 years to learn. And it's really true. I was not raised in the church. I didn't know the church. Certainly didn't know the evangelical church. So I didn't, so it was just an opportunity for me to learn my own church baggage. <laughs> you know, because we always take stuff along with us to different places. But Jackie's right. When we go somewhere, the very DNA of how we were made and what we did here is replicated in different places. We've been church planting missionaries under the Evangelical Free Church of America for 17 years, and we have about a, well, 106 churches have been started in the last 17 years, and thousands in India, Canada, and Costa Rica. God's been good, been really good. Um, not bad for a guy that was uh, almost ready to become a car dealer. I was general sales manager for Village Pontiac. In fact, the scary thing about all this Bob and Lynn Whitney and Jackie and I joke around. I knew Bob and Lynn when they were teenagers. Um, that's, that goes back. I was, of course, a pagan until I was 29. So uh, anyway, it was just fun to, to look back. I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43. Um, some of the most fruitful days of fast growth for me was sitting under... Ken, Pastor Ken Hall's ministry. Some of you remember him. Again, I wasn't raised in the church, so when he would preach in 45 minutes or an hour, an hour and a half, I, it, it didn't bother me. I didn't know any different. I guess ignorance is bliss, they say. And I was going through the other day, and I have every sermon I ever sat under him in writing that I wrote. I was like a sponge. And I also have boxes of cassette tapes of his messages. He, God really used him to impact my life. And the elders, everybody from, yeah, I'm not going to start naming names. It, I, I can go on and on. One of the things Ken used to say from the pulpit, and especially our Wednesday night prayer meetings, remember those prayer meetings? Sometimes there were 40, 50, 60 people that would come to a prayer meeting. We'd all sit around these big circles, and we would pray, and we would worship. And it, 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 I've been at some that went on for hours. But Ken, there's two things I picked up from Ken along the way. First of all, um, start reading a proverb a day. So it's been 34 and a half years, and I still read a proverb a day. Um, there's 31, kind of fits, and uh, don't get legalistic about it, but I've been doing that. It helped me tons. Um, the second thing I did is, Ken would say, whenever you've, and some of you heard these same words, whenever you feel distance from God, and you feel like you can't get to God through prayer, and you feel like that, he says, start in Isaiah 40 and work yourself through Isaiah 66 and read a chapter a day because it kind of funnels into understanding the majesty and the sovereignty and the greatness of our almighty God. And I've done that. And uh, when we were getting ready to leave here in 1989, and I was having these... I, I had a year's discussion with, I think it was about a, 10 months to a year before um, I introduced John's name to the elders that he was interested. Um, we were talking about some of this, but God spoke to me um, and gave me a promise from his word. And it's the passage I want to bring to you today. And the last day I was here, I believe, I addressed this passage in a different way. And it's a passage that's um, one of hope. It's a passage, um, I've, I've just learned in preparing this again, 
because I, I don't like to repeat things. I like to go fresh. I've learned some things I just have never seen before. It's one of the beautiful things about the Word of God. And in this passage, it's, it's, it's actually Isaiah 43, 18, verse 21. He says, Do not call to the mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. He says, Behold, I will do something new. It will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make road, a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beast of the field will glorify me, the jackals, the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. I was like, wow. I was going to a new church. Jackie and I have journeyed to eight years in a small town in Wisconsin among the European Dutch dairy farming community. That was a trip. Um, God did some marvelous things there, but then we ended up being church planting missionaries in Colorado and Wyoming. And then I made the mistake of praying for a friend who was struggling getting church planted in the South. And so five years ago, God called us to the South and the Southern States. All along the way, God has surprised me by saying, listen, Bruce, I'm going to do something new. The trick here is, are you going to be even aware of it? And I realized back in the 80s that God wanted to do something, but often the problem was I wasn't listening. Or I was too busy with my agenda. And this passage is a passage of uh, comfort, but even more than that, it's a passage that, a passage that displays the faithfulness of God. Whew, it's, it's, it's overwhelming with God's faithfulness. When you start to go through dark times, uncharted waters, uh, something new, a little strange. I'm, I mean, the case with Jackie and I is I thrive on change. She likes change. We, we just, we're, we're crazy. We're nuts. But for what God has called us to, it fits. And God doesn't call everybody that way. In a chronological Bible that Jackie was reading through, in the introduction on Isaiah, he writes this, and I'm going to read this to you because I, when, when, when Jackie read it to me in the car, I thought, oh my goodness, this just encapsulates what Isaiah is prophesizing here. He says, already, quote, the northern tribes have t- been taken into captivity. But after the reign of Hezekiah, the people turned to paganism, which Manasseh fostered as king. Therefore, Isaiah once again takes to the streets to warn about idolatry, sorcery, and even astrology. Now, in his last days, Isaiah's, most of Israel, was already in exile. Isaiah shifts his emphasis into the presence of those in, the, in Judah's exile, and he writes as if he were viewing God's people after Jerusalem's destruction. He sees the people's despair in captivity in Babylon, But through this dark period, Isaiah sees God's revelation, the people's return, and their restoration as a people and as a nation. Isaiah wants to comfort and to give the people hope that God is faithful and will follow through on his promises. He wants to reveal that what is about to happen, when it does, the people will know God is disciplining them and yet will deliver them. God didn't want the people to attribute anything to their pagan rituals and gods that they were worshiping. God wanted all the glory. Then Isaiah's prophecies further remind the people in chapter 40 through 66 of the coming Messiah, his everlasting kingdom of justice, righteousness, salvation, his choosing of Israel to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the passages of restoration that provide hope and help for the people in displaying who God really is, and what only he can do, and the redemption, ultimately, of the Gentiles' eternal joy and peace. The writer goes on, he says, in all scripture, Isaiah's prophecies concerning Israel's restoration and the coming Messiah may be the most marvelous, wonderful, comforting, inspiring, optimistic, encouraging words ever read by a believer, particularly a believer, who has endured great personal suffering, despair, and even spiritual exile. Isaiah, finally, makes a few solemn warnings through these chapters to those who persist in unrighteousness. But there's hope for all sinners and willing to acknowledge their guilt and repent and turn their lives back to God 
and to his service. Wow, unquote. When Jackie read that, I thought, I've studied Isaiah for years in Bible school and um, just my personal, I thought, that boy, that guy just nailed, nailed it down in a couple paragraphs. In the last 50 years of this particular congregation, the people, uh, we as people, you as people, have a lot to celebrate. I have a lot to celebrate. My beginning, my foundation, your beginning maybe, and your foundation, and, and, and Rutch, you and I have that in common, was both of our beginnings here. God did a work, and along the way, some of our dear friends and family have gone home to be with the Lord already. Maybe they've moved away. Individuals who invested in many of us, sacrificed much, uh, to build this, to even build this local church and st- to stabilize a body of believers and help this church face the different seasons of ministry. Now, we walk through that as we coach couples in starting new churches. It takes five to seven years to stabilize a new congregation. By that time, we hope they can at least pay their pastor. I mean, things like that. It's just those little things you take for granted. When you start something new, I remember some of those early stories from from Hal Maris, Zila, the Johnsons, and others about just praying for God to show up and do this. Didn't you meet in a garage or something early on? Yeah. Just phenomenal stories, and we see those stories all over. Somebody will say to me, well, um, I want to do a church like this, and I'm just saying, you know, why don't you just listen to the Holy Spirit and obey what God tells you to do? Don't worry about what other people are doing. The Holy Spirit's so creative and how he wants to shape you and use you. And and this is what he's done here at this church. So in 50 years, folks, there's a lot to celebrate. God has proved himself that he is more than faithful. So in this passage here today, I don't want to lose sight of that. Of just, and I guess one main thing, please, if you go from here, just remember this. God's not done with you. It isn't about glory days. The glory days are ahead. They're not behind. In fact, that's what he says here in the passage in verse 18. Um, he, he talks about the faithfulness of God in our past. And he says, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Why, why did Israel have a tendency to always go back to like it was? Do you ever wonder, can I go back to like it was? It'll never be like it was. Why do we do that? Why did Israel, when it complained about God and complained about their circumstances, always wanted to go back to Egypt? That's something I picked up years ago. And I'll, I'll ask people, why? You're talking like you want to go back to Egypt. Why do you want to go there? God wants to do something new. God wants something new that, that you're not even aware of yet. Too many times we, th- we throw the towel in too quick. And in this passage here, see, Israel had a tendency to go back, and even the Jewish people today to go back, to Abraham and to Moses and to Jacob and to Ishmael and all those things on the covenants and how God showed up. and Because um, God was faithful in those covenants. He was faithful in his promises to those men. And so Israel today even still will go back to them and cry out for God to show up and do what he did in the past. Um, God's saying here, don't ponder the past. Yeah, God was faithful in the past, and God did some miraculous and phenomenal things in the past. He did it here. The things we've experienced over the years, we saw God move here like never before in our lives. And you have too. Um, I, I, w- I was talking to Bob Whitney before, and I said, you know, Bob, what would be a, a fascinating thing is for each individual here who's been here longer than five years, to write down when they came here, then just answer this one question. What are the spiritual milestones or things you saw God, that only God could do here, that you actually witnessed? See, what would be fun today is for me to just step down here, sit down with a microphone, pass it around, and you all tell your stories. What has God done? Or what is he doing? Or are you fighting against listening to God? I mean, there's so many things we could talk about here. Israel was in that thing where they, wanna, they always wanted to go back to the past. And one of the things I've experienced about the past is when you go back, it's never like it used to be. Have you ever figured that out? Maybe I'm a little slow, but the past can be attractive because we've already experienced it, 
even the difficult times. That's why sometimes people don't even want to get help for their problems because they've experienced the pain and they're afraid of new pain. It's just human nature. It doesn't mean any, anybody's wrong. It's just what we do. It's just part of our makeup. So he says, don't ponder the things of the past. God is always at work among his people. His spirit is always calling and sending out. And the relief that stabilizes believers is knowing that there's only one constant, and that's change, and there's only one thing that never changes, and that's God himself, because he's faithful. God will never change. Folks, he's not done with you. Look at verse 1 of this chapter. Let me just skip through this. This is, and this is the beauty of Isaiah 40 through 66. And so if your view of God's small or maybe you feel distance from God, start reading the chapter today. But listen to this. In verse 1, he's the creator and he, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. He says, I have called you. The last part of verse 1, he says, you are mine. He said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Talk about comfort. Verse 3 says, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom. And he goes on. Verse 4, and this is, oh, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. Verse 5, do not fear, I'm with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even who I have made. He goes on talking about their witness. Verse 10, he goes, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, and before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. That's, a, that's God declaring his deity and saying, hey folks, I'm here, and it's about me. It's not about you. He goes on and he, he talks about, the, Isaiah goes in verse 14 as he prophesies, he says, the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake, I sent you to Babylon. He sent them into captivity. He sent them to be disciplined for their sake. And I will bring them. And sometimes God does that in our own personal walk with God. It's the, what, to bring us closer to Christ and to be dependent on him. So tough times happen in relationships and just in life itself. But God's shaping us and he's making us into the people he wants us to be. And then he comes down here to verse 15. He says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. It's a very important piece right now because people have moved into Babylon. Babylon, They've set up, they built houses, they planted gardens, they've been entrenched in paganism. And now the prophecy comes to them. They're comfortable. Ever been comfortable? And God enters their world and says, do not call to mind the former things. Behold, I'm going to do something new. He used that verse in me again five years ago when he called me to the southeast. The Spirit of God brought it to my mind. He said, I'm going to do something new with you. You're, you're moving. I'm like, whoa. <coughs> God's always at work, folks. He's faithful. And it's about him and what he wants to do. When I think of the past, and Jackie alluded to it, <coughs> I was going through my journals, and I counted between 32 to 35 students and adults that committed themselves and are actually in full-time vocational work now. Some from the church. You know, we have a, a student that was led to Christ either in our living room or right downstairs, and um, she and her husband... Um, went overseas to Eastern Bloc country. They planted churches. They made disciples. We have a guy from our church, one of our church families. He, he built a team at his university, and they went over to St. Petersburg, Florida. The day the wall came down, crew, Campus Crusade, launched a team in there. It was led by people from this church that opened up camp, um, Russia to camp, for Campus Crusade, but they were led by kids from this church. Marvelous. Another... Another young boy that got saved in his senior year, went overseas, he's married, and he came out of that same university, went to the same school as a number of them did, and 
Um, he and his wife have been undercover for 17 years and have launched nine training centers in Mongolia. First, they went in there, lived, made relationships, led people to Christ, and moved to nine different locations, setting up training centers for the purpose of disciple making and church planting. That started here. You want to rejoice and celebrate how God has used you? God's not done with you. God isn't done with this church. I remember early on, the elders and Ken talking about the possibility. His, remember Ken said his heart would just see that God would just touch the hearts of laymen and send them out. God has. Everybody from good old Gene Pond and Carrie Warren, who started a Bible school among the Native Americans, and I could go on and on, the Ruses and, and so many others, the Taylors. By the way, Craig and Gene Taylor said hi. Some of you know them, some of you don't. But to, when you look at the past, we need to celebrate what God did. When you look at the spiritual milestones, even in our own life, we need to rejoice and give God the praise for it, but then we need to move on. The Milligans were our first middle school leaders and led the middle school after I turned it over to them for nine years. Fabulous workers. We love Bob and Stephanie. But that was God. 70% of the kids that went to that youth ministry called Freewind came from outside these church walls. I really thought, Rutch, that you built that multi-purpose building for the youth group. I, I actually did. It was, it was like um, heaven. I didn't invite people to church. I invite them to the gym. And um, it was just great. We saw God change a lot of lives. Saw God change a lot of marriages. Saw God just do some marvelous things. That's the past. The last 25 years, I'm sure there's a lot of stories I haven't seen, I haven't heard. And you can tell them too. In fact, I, I kind of chuckled when Mike Fern called me about doing this. He said, yeah, we're looking for somebody, you know, some, one of the old guys to come back. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not that old. <laughs> I know what he meant, but it was funny. One of God's sense, things of sense of humor here. Folks, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to rejoice in in the faithfulness of watching God work in the past in our lives and the lives of those around us. Has it always been fun? Sometimes there's there's a lot of bruised bruised hearts, hurt people. I mean, let's face it. The church is great if there's just one, but you start adding others, it gets a little complicated. (laughs) We got to learn how to work together and be together. So in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and in this new century, God was faithful in the past. Rejoice in that. And just realize this one thing. He's not done with you. Just not done with you. And he wasn't done with Israel. And that's what he's saying. Don't ponder those things in the past. He says, I'm going to do something new. And that's the second thing here to grasp hold of um, grace porn people is that um, whatever milestones we've experienced, whatever strengths we see that's here, we're going to see the faithfulness of God in his promises. Not only in the past, but in his promises. We all have, maybe some of us have, some of God's promises we like to hold on to, we like to grasp hold of. And they're comforting and difficult times and maybe that. But listen to what he says. Behold, I will do something new. It will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will make even a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Wow. There's a sense here of God wanting to do something that's a little bit out of our comfort zone. A little bit different. Um. But there's also a sense that, uh, in anticipation, I believe, at least that's how I looked at it, that God's not done with me. He wants to do a work again like he did before, but it's going to be different because it's going to be God. And God using people we would never have dreamed of. Uh, and all through this passage here in verse 21, um, well, verse 20, he says, to give drink to my chosen people. And he says, and the people whom I form will declare my praise. God wants to use you, his people. You're his church. Some of us just have to raise up, speak up, pray up, and love up, and just keep, just keep involved. Because as I learned something else from my pastor, Ken Hall, there are only two things eternal, and it won't be this building, but it'll be the word of God and it'll be people. So we can't get along now. You're going to have to figure out how to get along in heaven. Um, we got to learn how to care for each other. Be there for each other. Um, faith 
rests. I mean, when, when I see God's promises, I see in this anticipation of, 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 of a new beginning, it's going to require faith in our part. And when I thought of faith, I thought that my faith, your faith, has to rest in who God is. That's what Isaiah's prophesying here about. Uh, he's our king. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's majestic. He's holy. He's merciful. He's all those things. And he wants supremacy. And he's sovereign. And he will take it because he created it. But he's, what he's asking us and inviting us to do is join him in what he's doing. That all seeing, all knowing, all loving, ever present, holy God. Hmm. You know, in 1 Peter 2, the Spirit of God spoke to Peter, and Peter told the church that you are choice and you're precious and choice in the sight of God. I thought, wow. But you look at verse 4 in this passage. Uh, excuse me, verse, yeah, verse 4, it says, Since you are precious in my sight and since you are honored and I love you. I was 48 years old and I'm riding to a cemetery with my father and his two sisters in the car. I knew my dad always loved me. But he told me, he said, he's looking at his sisters, having a conversation while I'm sitting there and he says, I'm proud of him. I looked at him, I said, well, hey, Dad, why don't you look at me? I'm right here. Sometimes to say those kind of words to loved ones are hard. Or to even look at our own children or our spouse and say, you're really precious and I really love you. Have you ever had a parent who said that to you? Well, we got to God, who's eternal, who really looks through his eyes and says to you, you're precious. And I love you. I don't know about you, but that warms my heart. I've made it a point to go around over these last 30-some years and talk to people who have invested my life and just personally thank them. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for what God has done in his promises. And faith always rests in the person of God. It always looks through how God sees us, not how we see ourselves. I used to tell the high school students, 95% of life's issues can be solved by answering three questions. First of all, who is God? His character, his person, his promises to realize that God is faithful in who he is. Second was, what did Christ really do for us? The scripture tells us if we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. What did Christ do for us? The psalmist prayed, but you, O Lord, are, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. When you read through the Old Testament, you keep bouncing around this word called loving kindness. In the Hebrew, it's your steadfast, loyal love. And he did it for his namesake, not because of anything you or I do. That's how much God loves us. He loves us through his, his son, Jesus. And third question was, who are we in Christ? When we understand how God looks at us, and possibly there's a chance we could start to look at ourselves differently as well and look at others differently and realize God does love deeply. See, the answers and the applications of these truths can strengthen our spiritual core to where we can trust God for those things that are just seem to just knock us right over as he calls us to walk in faith with him. It's those unexplainables in life. Have you ever had anything that's unexplainable, you can't make sense of? Don't even feel like you can pray? You don't even know if God really cares? He does. Faith obeys what God asks. Faith often requires us to move from our comfort zone and push us into places we've never been. You're about ready as a congregation to get placed into new memories, new experiences that you've never had before. So hold on for the ride. But you know what? You only think you control the direction. God's really in control. Proverbs says man plans his way. It's God that directs your steps. 
Our responsibility is in faith to be looking to him. That's what he's saying here in this passage. Behold, I will do something new. It will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? Our job is to be, you know, are we looking? Are we aware of it? How are we seeing God work? He said, the beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches. The beasts, the jackals and the ostriches, if you follow them through the Old Testament, speak of desolation. He says, even those, he's going to give water to them in the desert, and they themselves will give me praise. Marvelous, marvelous to understand the faithfulness of God, not only in the past, but in his promises. The third thing I see here in these verses here is really the faithfulness of of God and his purposes. God always accomplishes that which he intends to do. In fact, if you want to look at the bottom line, you you want to see the end result, you look at verse 21. He says, the people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. God wants to receive the glory from his people, from us, from Israel. He will in the end. Redeem Israel, our remnants of Israel, but nevertheless, he wants us as his people to declare his praise. How do you declare his praise? How do you give God the glory? Jesus said in John 17, verse 4, he's praying to the Father, he said, Father, I have glorified you on earth. And listen to this, having accomplished the work you have given me to do. You want to know how you glorify God in your own life? Let's just obey God and accomplish what he's given you to do. That in itself, just obeying our almighty God, our king, brings glory to him. And he's telling Israel here in this prophecy here, I'm going to do something so new. Yes, I'm preparing you to be my children. He's inviting us as we know in the New Testament, to join him in what he's doing. He wants us to align with his purposes, but he wants us to participate in them. He wants you to work through this as his chosen people. We're his. There's no plan B. The church, the church was God's plan for all ages till he returns. There's no other plan. It's his church. It's his universal church, his local church, and you the church, me the church. That's God's plan. We look at ourselves and say, I'm not prepared. You're right, you're not, but God is. And never think and never get caught in the trap of thinking you don't know enough or you're not ready enough. Because remember in the Old Testament when Balaam wouldn't speak, God used the mouth of his donkey. (laughs) It's never about us. So many times we get locked into thinking church is about us and our relationships are about us, but it's really about what God wants to do. It's a whole different mindset. And when we see the faithfulness of God and his purposes, he's asking all of us to align ourselves with his purposes and join him in what he's doing. That's why in Jesus' high priestly prayer, multiple times, he says, Father, as you sent me, I want to send them. You and I are to live sent. We are to be nomadic as we go through this life. We are to represent the Christ, the gospel, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who one day will return. And wants everybody to come into his kingdom if they would. Why did Israel fall into paganism? I sat here and I'm thinking, you know, paganism is pretty comfortable. In paganism, you create your own God, you set your own rules, your own guidelines. You know, we don't go so far as having a policy manual. But in suburbia, we use a calendar. We use activities, we use excuses as to why we can't be there and why we can't serve and why can't we come alongside somebody else and invest in their lives. You know, we allow other things to move into our life and to become a God for us. Paganism always calls us to avoid addressing the reality that there is a creator God who's almighty, who's sovereign, and does what he pleases and directs us in his purposes. The end result is we're going to declare his praise. I was at my 30th class reunion this last year at Moody. Um, When I went to Moody, being an older student, I was 30 years old. doesn't sound old, but I was 30. And um, the average student at the time was 19, so I felt a little old. Um, I had a couple pals down there. One of them was Roy Schwartz. Uh, We connected. Um, Some of us car salesmen got together and would tell our stories. It was 
fun days, but this reunion, I met a guy for the first time I had not seen since school. He lived in one of the dorms, so I never really hung out with him. And he, he, he actually lives in Glen Ellen. And one of the things he talked about is how he's responsible for starting the Heretics Club. He's got a Heretics Club called Moody Bible Institute Heretics Club. I thought, wow. I said, uh, why'd you do that? Or I said, how many people are in this? He goes, well, there's 260 of us. I said, who leads it? He goes, I do. I said, okay. So I said, can you tell me why there's a Heretics Club? He said, well, he said, um, I... I said, do you have a bad experience at Moody? No. He says, Moody was really good. He says, but 10 years after I graduated Moody, my parents got divorced. I could never forgive God for doing that to my parents. Whoa. (laughs) Uh, There's some wrong thinking going on here. So I said, "Can can I ask you another question? He says, sure. I said, well, who's in this heretics club? He said, well, in all honesty, 70 to 75% of them are probably gay, lesbian. Well, that's interesting. We go to Moody, we know the scriptures, we know what God thinks about that, so now we're going to have a heritage club because we don't agree with what God says in his word. That's eternal, by the way. And so we had this discussion. That's what we do with our calendars, though. So we really believe that God was supreme, and, and he really believed that we were, God was faithful in his purposes. We would be aligning ourselves with what God wanted for our lives and not necessarily what we want. That's what my old college buddy was doing. The Heretics Club was a safe place for all those people to gather who decided to walk off in disobedience from what God had been teaching them. We do that in our relationships. We just do that in life, don't we? But hear this. The God who's faithful in the past, the God who's faithful in his promises, he's also faithful in his purposes. And that what she started, he will finish. In humility and dependence, we find strength. In experiencing the blessings, we find God and trust in his faithfulness. Uh, 50 years here, awesome. The trials, the errors, the losses, the victories, the celebrations. Um, All I can tell you this morning as I look at this passage, God wants to do something new. I I can't even tell you what it is. But that just gives me hope because, real hope, by the way, um, because God's not done. And it's because it all is based upon his faithfulness. God is faithful to give us a future and a hope. He shapes us. uh, The scripture says that hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's real hope. Jesus said, come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest Uh, David uh, wrote in Psalm 23 that you can have the green pastures, but first you've got to come through the valleys. You're about ready to enter a valley. Maybe some of you feel like you're there. Oh, our pastor's gone. You know, the church, you know, as much as you think, the church isn't about the pastors. It's about a holy God that works through the people that he's brought here. That's what he's doing. The last thing... Isaiah prophesies and reminds the people in verse 22 to 27. I didn't want to do it because it's like pouring salt on an open wound as he basically calls them to repent. He says, you're burdened to me. You're not even bringing your sacrifices to me. And he says, I, even one who wipes away your transgressions for my own sake. You know, God forgives us not for us. He forgives us for his name. Why? Because he wants the glory. He's God. An old writer named Oswald Chambers, wrote this. And if you want to look at it, it's December 18th, I think, 2014. You can read this in his devotional. He says, It is only a faithful person who truly believes that God sovereignly controls his circumstances. We take our circumstances for granted, saying God is in control, but not really believe in it. We act as if things happen that were completely controlled by people. To be faithful in every circumstances means that we have only one loyalty and object of our faith, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. God may cause our circumstances to suddenly fall apart, which may bring the realization of our faithful unfaithfulness to him for not recognizing that he has ordained the situation. We never saw what he was trying to accomplish, and that exact offense the um, event will never be repeated in our life. This is where the test of our faithfulness comes. 
if we will just learn to worship God, even during the difficult circumstances, he will change them for better very quickly if he chooses. Being faithful to Jesus Christ is the most important thing we can try to do today. Be faithful in our work. Be faithful as we invest in others. And to anyone, anything else, just don't ask us to be faithful to Jesus Christ. That might take everything. Many Christians become very impatient. We talk about faithfulness to Christ. Uh, you know, I'm not even going to read the rest of it, but, you know, as I look at this passage, folks, Isaiah prophesied, and he said, you'll see God's faithfulness in the past. Take time, reflect on the past, rejoice, celebrate, but move on. Remember, God's going to do something new. Rejoice in the faithfulness of God's promises. This is a promise here. He's going to do something new. The trick is, are we even going to be aware of it? And then he goes on here and he says, God's going to be faithful in his purposes. That which God has started, he will finish. What he started in your life, he's going to complete it. Why? Because he said he would. It all comes down to that. He's God. He's our king. And rejoice in him. We have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to celebrate, and a lot to rejoice in. So blessings. Thank you so much again. What a joy this has been. Love you all, really.